So good morning everybody and welcome. Let me introduce you to our first lecturer this morning who is Professor Frank Close from the University of Oxford. Before going to Oxford, Frank was head of the theory division at the Rutherford Appleton Laboratory in the United Kingdom and also head of communications and public education group at CERN. Frank is very well known for his many contributions to particle physics research, but he's also very well known for his efforts in popularizing science uh, not least of which his many books on particle physics, which I dare say many of you have already read. Frank is going to give us an introduction, a very basic introduction, he tells me, to particle physics. So let's begin. Thanks. Um, let me just repeat what Ben has just said. This is, as it describes, an introduction for non-physics students. There are people here who are engineering students, computer science students, some of whom have not met particle physics at all. And, of course, there are people here who have met particle physics. During the course of this whole summer student season, there will be some pretty good, deep lectures on particle physics for you. There will also be introductory lectures to those deep lectures for you. Mine are the introduction to the introductory lectures to those. So it is given at a level which is going to be primarily popular, but it is also legitimate, I hope. There are occasions when I will have to sort of try to gloss over things, but I will not, as far as I can tell, tell any lies. But where I do gloss over things, I have put government health warnings, and I will make it clear to you when that happens occasionally. And uh, I know there are also the teachers here as well, so this lecture is being given to a lot of different types of people all the time. So hopefully at some point in the lectures, you will find something you enjoy, but don't sleep through the rest of it. Okay starting at the very beginning, for those people whose knowledge of particle physics and antimatter is based on Dan Brown, Angels and Demons is fiction. And the facts are, of course, outlined in this book that I'm now trying to write on the back of Dan Brown's success. I will tell you something about antimatter in these lectures, but uh, what I want to do is to set the really big scene, and then we can develop from there. So I'd like to start with the question, how old is the universe? And... Of course, the answer, 14 billion years, is easy to say but hard to comprehend. And so what I like to do is to imagine that now corresponds to the end of this first lecture at 10 o'clock and imagine that one hour of our time corresponds to a billion years of the universe and so you can work back. The Big Bang would have taken place at 8 o'clock last night. And if you can now just go over in your minds what has happened to you in the last 14 hours and compare it with what has happened in the universe in 14 billion years, it's quite a surprise to see how far things have developed as of now. That's all of last night, you know, you eat, drank, slept. Five o'clock this morning was when the sun emerged. Six o'clock this morning when the earth emerged. Breakfast, come to the lectures here. It won't be until half past nine that the oldest fossils appear. Humanoids, the great apes, will be half a minute before 10 o'clock. Everything that we know that these lectures consist of will be in that amount of time before 10 o'clock. So we've discovered how the universe has developed in the blink of an eye, essentially. And what we know about the universe is shown on this, which will be one of the themes that I'm going to use. It's the nature of the universe as it is now, comparing it with the universe as it was then. And... Today, the universe out in deep space is very cold, minus 270 degrees centigrade, 3 degrees Kelvin, the background radiation. We here on Earth are rather warmer, 
ambient temperature about 300 degrees K because the sun is shining at us. The heart of the sun is at about 10 million degrees. And uh, along the side of this, I've got a thermometer with scales of energy. Thousands of an electron volt, EV, thousands, millions, billions, and trillions of electron volts. And the relationship between temperatures and energies we will come to in the course of this first lecture. Now, there's nowhere pretty much hotter than the center of the stars in the universe today, but that's not the hottest that we know of. There is one place that hopefully in a few months will be hotter, and until a few years ago was hotter, namely down in the center of the accelerator that was called LEP when it was the Large Electron-Positron Collider and is now the LHC when it will be the Large Hadron Collider. By smashing particles together, their energy in a very small volume is analogous to, if it was repeated everywhere, to temperatures in the billions of degrees. And in that sense, you are in these experiments replicating in the laboratory the sort of conditions that the actual universe was like less than a billionth of a second after the real Big Bang. And by observing what happens there, we can learn about the physics as it was then. The universe, of course, then expanded and cooled, and after about three minutes, the ambient temperature of the universe was similar to what you find in the center of the stars today. And then, of course, it cooled further, and over 14 billion years is deep cold out there now. So what we have been doing for thousands of years is studying the physics of the universe as it is now. In the last few decades, we have realized that by doing experiments in nuclear physics, we can understand what the universe is like in the center of stars, or, if you like, what it was like three minutes after the Big Bang. And by doing the experiments that we do here at CERN, we can see what the universe was like within a billionth of a second after the Big Bang. And the sort of picture that we've discovered is that today, in the cold, there's a lot of structure. I mean, there's us, there's buildings, there's planets, there's galaxies, there's atoms and elements. It's structure and that we see. But as we go to hotter and hotter conditions, or if you like, as we go back to the earlier and earlier physics of the universe, we find this structure, in a profound way, sort of melts away, leaving a very pure symmetry behind, which I've symbolized by these grains of sand on this picture, and what this means I'll explain at the end of the fourth lecture. But this general idea of there being a profound symmetry in hot conditions, which freezes out into structures and patterns in cold conditions, is something which permeates all of science and is at the root of this desire to find the Higgs boson and all of that stuff that the Large Hadron Collider is about. And hopefully by the end of these fourth lectures, you will have a sense of what this is. And here, of course, is a particular example of it. Snowflakes below the freezing point of water show a beautiful six-fold pattern. Melt the snowflake by raising the temperature, that six-fold pattern disappears, and you get a completely uniform symmetry. This is one out of many examples of patterns disappearing and different symmetries emerging as you heat things up. And we will see that the universe as a whole, we believe, exhibits this sort of phenomenon as you go from present-day temperatures to the extreme energies that we will measure at the LHC. So that's how things began. There was nothing at all. And then out of it, out of this Big Bang, emerged matter and antimatter in perfect balance to the best experiments that we can do. And we all know from Star Trek and even experiments that when matter and antimatter meet, they annihilate one another. And so that then raises the big question, which we still don't know the answer to, why is it that a billionth of a second later, the newly born matter and antimatter hadn't mutually annihilated one another and destroyed the universe? So how is it that 14 billion years later, the universe appears to be made primarily of matter, antimatter in bulk, we find no evidence for at all? This asymmetry is critical to us being here. The origin of it is one of the great unsolved problems which we hope we will get the answers to at the LHC. But we will talk about this again, and you'll hear more about this in other lectures. So to give an idea of the scale of things that we can do in science and what we know about the universe, 
we have been able to explore the universe over 40 orders of magnitude in distance scale. That the observable universe, about 10 to the 26 meters, of course, we build instruments to expand our sensors beyond the immediate ones that we have. Telescopes show us deep space. If you want to start looking at the smaller structures of things, you need to build microscopes. And if you want to study the very small structures of things down at the levels of 10 to the minus 15 meters or even smaller, you have very special microscopes, which is what particle accelerators are. And what I'm going to do in a minute is actually show you how these numbers of things all merge together, why it is that particle accelerators are microscopes, why they probe these distance scales, why you need the energies that you need. So, the basic game that started many, many years ago, is what is matter made of? And there are three broad ways that we know how to do that. You can look at it, you can smash it up, which is obviously more fun, or you can heat it up and see what happens. As we will see, all of these three are doing the same thing in different ways, but let's take them one at a time. Looking at things, well, you're seeing me because light is shining on me, and you see it in your eyes. You've got a light source, an object, and your eye. To introduce you to the jargon of particle physics, this is a particular example of what we do all the time. In this case, light is a beam of radiation. You have a beam which you fire at a target, and then you detect the scattered beam. And from that, you work out what the target is made of. So why can't we do it just by looking? Well, there's a limit to what you can see with your eyes. The limits of... Uh, vision with the rainbow are about 10 to the minus 4 meters for the eye. Bacteria are even smaller than that. Atoms much smaller. The atomic nucleus, quarks, and electrons, yet smaller still. So it's not a problem of you haven't got a powerful enough uh, magnifying glass. There's an inherent problem of resolution. And I'll show you now in a minute uh, what I mean by that and how we conquer it. So to look at things smaller than bacteria, we need to have special instruments that are going to be able to extend our vision. And the problem is the fact that light, at least the wavelengths of light that our eyes respond to, are very large on the scale of atoms, let alone the smaller things. So if I scale up like a wavelength of green light right there in the middle of the rainbow, compared to the size of an atom, you see the atom is incredibly small compared to it. So the light just passes by without being disturbed. In order to see an atom, let alone resolve its internal structure, you need to have a wavelength which is comparable to or smaller than the object you want to look at. I mean, those of you who go sailing, you sort of aware of the fact if you've got a nice uh, rolling waves going along, a small, sh a small yacht will just bob up and down on the waves without disturbing them whereas a large oil tanker will scatter the waves, and in principle, you could imagine detecting the scattered waves and working out that there was an oil tanker there. So the moment that wavelength is smaller than an object, that object will be resolved. So we need to have waves that are smaller than atoms. Now, one of the great things that was discovered in the 1920s is that not just light is a wave, but all particles have wave-like characteristics. That's one of the basics of quantum mechanics. And that the wavelength, for example, of an electron, the wavelength is inversely proportional to the momentum. So the higher the speed, the higher the energy, the higher the momentum, the smaller the wavelength, and hence the better the resolution you can receive. So by having high-energy electrons, you can probe small distances and resolve these structures. So that's the basic idea of going to short wavelengths. The second part of the thing is to smash things apart, which is using energy. Well, I'll talk about that in a moment, but let's get down to some facts first of all. I know from our first year students in uni at Oxford, one all grows up with jewels, and it takes a long time getting people away from this. Joules are great when you're dealing with macroscopic objects, but for individual particles, the energies are point, typically point naught, 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 ones of a joule, and that's a very messy way of writing things, even if you put 10 to the minus something. So we use more practical units when we're talking about particles, and that's why we use 
electron volts, EV, thousands, millions, billions of them. And so those are the units that we'll be meeting. Uh, the definition of the electron volt, that is the energy that a single electron would gain if it was accelerated through a potential difference of one volt. It's of the order of 10 to the minus 19 joules. KEV, MEV, GEV, thousands, millions, billions, and trillions, TEV. It just occurred to me that it used to be the case that trillions were large numbers that nobody had a feeling for until the bankers discovered them. So typically, the energies at LEP, which terminated around 2000, were the order of a couple of hundred GeV. The energies at the LHC will be about 14 TeV. It's those huge energies that we're reaching. So the question is, what do those huge energies mean in terms of what we can do with them? The other thing about energy is uh, that it's the E in mc squared, and you will be using, I mean, particle physics is practical relativity, in a way, and the uh, critical equation that you will be using, I like to show it as a sort of Pythagoras triangle, where if the length on one side is the energy at rest, the mc squared of the object, and the length of the vertical is the energy in its momentum, the P times C in the object, then the total energy is the length of the hypotenuse. Hence, E squared is PC all squared plus MC squared all squared. So far, so good. Now, the dimensions of energy, let's say typically GeV, the way that we physicists use the dimensions of momentum, I mean, P times C has dimensions of energy. So the dimensions of P will be energy divided by C. So we say that momentum has dimensions GV over C. And mass has dimensions GV over C squared. However, we get very lazy and we tend to just drop the Cs and we will all the time be saying that momentum has got dimensions of GV and mass has got GV. We get used to it. We know what we're doing. But don't panic if you think, that's not what I learned in school. Okay, that is how it, it is. You get used to it very quickly. So I will be saying masses of GEV and, uh, all the time, and everybody does. So just happily accept it. Um, another unit of length, 10 to the minus 15 meters, typically the size of a, a nucleus or, or particle, that sort of scale, uh, is known as one Fermi. And we tend to use distances in Fermis to get an idea of where we're at. So apart from these definitions and the accounting schemes, now let's move forward again. The link between wavelength that I talked about a few moments ago and energy is quantum mechanics. I said that uh, the momentum of a particle is inversely proportional to the wavelength. The relationship uh, for energy is 1 over the wavelength, multiplied by the speed of light, multiplied by h, which is Planck's quantum. Now, the velocity divided by wavelength is the same as a frequency, so E equals h nu, which you are all probably familiar with. So if you know the velocity of light and you know the value of h, you can work out the relationship in quantitative terms between this amount of energy and that amount of wavelength. And so this is the first of only two things I think I would recommend that you write down for reference, because we're going to use it, that when you put the numbers in, you find that one electron volt is of the order of 10 to the minus 6 meters in resolution terms. And we'll make use of that in, in a few moments. So that's the quantitative relation, very approximately, between energy scales and distance scales. Now let's come to the third of the ways of looking at what things are made of, heating them up, temperature. And here, again, courtesy of Boltzmann's constant, there is a relationship between energy and temperature. And this is the second thing I would recommend that we write down to make use of, that when you put the numbers in for Boltzmann's constant, you find that 1 EV of energy is of the order of 10,000 degrees Kelvin. So if you have got a particle collision at a certain energy, you can, in quotation marks, say that corresponds to a certain temperature. Let me just be here as an example of being careful, of course. Temperature is a statement about a macroscopic system where all the individual 
pieces have a sort of Gaussian distribution. They don't all have the same energy. Um, a particle beam has got particles of a given energy. So saying that they have a, a temperature is a pretty loose concept, but qualitatively speaking, this is really what I'm meaning in, in the sort of scale of things. So there we have it. We have a quantitative relation between energy and wavelength. One EV is 10 to the minus 6 meters. We have a quantitative relation between energy and temperature. One EV is 10,000 degrees. So if you like, you can say, if I had something at 10,000 degrees, I have the potential to be able to resolve things on the micron scale. What do these things mean? Well, let's, let's see. Well, I showed you a moment or two ago the scale of distance on which various things we might want to look at are, and said we couldn't see them with ordinary light. I've now added to that list what the energy corresponding to those distances is, using those numbers that I just showed you. And you see that the wavelength of light corresponds to energies of the order of an EV. And we will see in a moment or two uh, even more about this. So if you've got a source that will provide you energies on the EV scale, it will tend to produce light that is visible. The distance scales for the atomic nucleus turn out in energy terms to correspond to 100 MeV to a GeV. So if you want to probe the atomic nucleus, you need to have beams of the order of a GeV. And that is where we were 50 years ago. The highest energy accelerators then were a few GeV. They were able to study the atomic nucleus and how it worked. If you want to get to distances of 10 to the minus 18 meters, which are the distance scales where the quarks inside the protons and neutrons live, you need to have energy scales of the order of a TeV, which is the energy scales that we are now at in particle physics. So you're seeing here now for the first time how energy scales in particle physics correspond to the distance scales that you can resolve. If you wanted to get to what's called the Planck length, which is theoretically where quantum gravity takes over, it's a scale of length that you can form using Planck's constant of quantum, the velocity of light for relativity, and g for gravitation. That corresponds to 10 to the minus 35 meters. And to resolve that, you'd need energies of 10 to the 20 GeV. And if you want to know how far away that is, starting from an EV, then the LHC isn't even halfway. So it's out of all possible ways of doing direct experiments on. So I shall be um, working and talking only north of the TeV line. So let's go then back to my original little picture, which showed the universe in temperature, energy, and time, and try to put these ideas together to see what it's really telling us. So, out there in deep space, as I said, it's very, very cold, three degrees Kelvin. The thermometer in the middle is showing energy scales, and the temperatures in blue next to them are the temperatures that correspond to those energy scales. As I said, one EV corresponds to 10,000 degrees, which indeed is what we have got. If you find the EV on the scale there, 10,000 degrees next to it. One KEV corresponds to... Uh, 10 to the 7 degrees. And as these numbers begin to make sense because you see that the sun, the heart of the sun at 10 to the 7 degrees, 10 to the 7 degrees, is a practical nuclear physics laboratory. There is nuclear fusion going on in the center of it. And the energy scales of the nuclear reactions that are taking place are typically on the KeV to MeV scale. The sun is burning at temperatures typically of those orders. Let's go back down to the, the bottom of this thermometer. We're starting off with milli, the little m, uh, milli electron volts, a thousandth of electron volt, is the energy scale which corresponds to typically room temperature. In fact, one fortieth of an electron volt corresponds to room temperature. Now, put your hand on your head for a moment, and you'll feel warmth. That warmth is being produced by your breakfast. I mean, you, you ate stuff. And a little bit of E equals mc squared in your cornflakes or bread or whatever you had is being converted into energy. It is chemical reactions taking place in your body where the molecules 
are rearranging themselves, and these reactions are acting on the milli EV scale. And the temperatures, the energies that are being produced are on the 300 degrees scale of Kelvin. That's body warmth. Now, if we turned out the lights in this room, we wouldn't be able to see each other. But if we had an infrared camera, it would show us all sitting here by the infrared radiation that we're emitting. Because in length scale, temperatures of 300 degrees Kelvin correspond to the infrared wavelengths of the electromagnetic radiation. So it begins to hold together. Room temperature, chemical reactions of molecules, infrared radiation in wavelength. If you now increase the temperature, what happens? Well, the wavelengths go down. Instead of infrared radiation, you now move into the optically visible region. If you turn on, for example, a, a bar radiator, the first that you will feel the warmth, and then it will start glowing red. And as it gets hotter, it will glow red and yellow as it moves through the optical spectrum. These lights are shining because the filaments are at many thousands of degrees. They are at the temperatures where the energies are now of the order of EV, and the wavelengths are in the optical region. You're now getting the individual electrons in atoms being excited at the atomic level rather than just the rather loosely bound molecules. If you now heat your atoms up to temperatures beyond 10,000 degrees, what happens? Well, the electrons in the atom are being given so much energy through the temperature that they can no longer hold themselves inside the atom. And the atoms become ionized. You form a plasma. Electrons and protons flowing around independently. Those are the conditions you find in the sun. By the time you get to the sun's center, it is far too hot for the atoms to survive. You've got a, a, a plasma, electrically charged plasma. And the typical range of electromagnetic radiation that is produced by the sun, well, the sun's got a whole range of temperatures, so, of course, it shines in optical light from the outside, but gamma rays and X-rays, shorter and shorter wavelengths from the electromagnetic spectrum are teaching astronomers about different temperature regions inside the sun and the stars. If you want to do experiments to probe those things with particle beams, if you want to start looking at those nuclear reactions, you need to have energy scales of MEVs and GEVs, as you see here. And so it's in that sense that the temperature of real objects in the universe correlates with the wavelengths or energies that you need to do experiments that will replicate them or study them. So you see here quantitatively how energy, temperature, and wavelength all fit together. Now, I developed this more in, in these books here, but uh, that's an advert because I want to do now, for the last few minutes, I call this particle physics in three minutes, but in fact it's particle physics in a little bit longer than that. To give a survey, really, of how we got here and where we think we're going to go next. I use the fact that um, Einstein's great year of discovery, 1905, was half a century before CERN began. And in 2005, they had this great Einstein celebration year. And so I was intrigued by how much we had learned in that century about the nature of matter. And in 1905, all that was known about particles were that atoms existed, but nobody knew what they consisted of. J.J. Thomson had discovered the electron, negatively charged constituents common to all atoms, but they didn't yet have any idea of how those electrons existed inside atoms. And Einstein, in addition to relativity, had come up with the idea of the photon, a thing that people often overlook, but that indeed was the first uh, theoretically invented particle, which was then experimentally discovered. So atoms were known, electrons were known, photons were known, and that was it. Fifty years later, when CERN began, this is the sort of logo that one had, but by then, atoms were known to contain electrons, 
The fact that atoms are electrically neutral meant there was positive charge in them as well to balance the electron's negative charge, which Rutherford showed us was on the atomic nucleus, which in turn was made of particles, protons and neutrons. And that was the structure of matter in 1955. The basic particles were electrons and protons and neutrons primarily. There were, in those days, attempts to try to unite physics. Einstein spent the last half of his life trying to weld together electromagnetism and gravity, the two forces that were the primarily known ones. The attempts to unify matter, though, immediately failed, because the electron and proton were utterly different. They miraculously had precisely counterbalancing electric charges, an interesting phenomenon, which we still don't fully understand. But the proton is 2,000 times more massive than an electron. It was, and it's also got a finite size, we now know. The electron, if it's got any size at all, it's smaller than 10 to the minus 18 meters, whereas a proton is about 10 to the 15 meters. Of course, we now know it's made of quarks. So protons and electrons looked utterly unlike each other, apart from the fact that their charge is balanced. So that was the state of matter in 1955. What about the forces? I often draw the analogy that um, if you try to draw an analogy between language and the structure of the universe, the basic smallest pieces of language are letters of the alphabet. There is nothing smaller than the letter that we know of. They are the analogues of the basic particles. But of course, to make sensible discussion, we have to combine those letters into words and the words into sentences to build the literature. And the rules that enable to do that are grammar. So the forces of nature are the analogues of grammar. They tell you how the basic bits join together and cooperatively work together. And the forces that were known then, apart from gravity, there were three. The electromagnetic force, which binds the electrons in the outer reaches of atoms by the electrical attraction to the opposite charge in the nucleus. The strong force, because the fact that atomic nuclei of heavy elements have got lots of protons, all positively charged, packed together, feeling an electrical repulsion, the nucleus would apparently want to blow apart, but clearly it doesn't, otherwise we wouldn't be here. So from that, they deduced there must be a very powerful attractive force at work inside the nucleus to hold them together. That was called the strong force. The third force, called weak, by comparison with strong, is what caused radioactivity, a certain type of radioactivity, beta decay, which changes one element into another and is very important in the centre of the sun, fusing hydrogen into helium and in stars building up heavier elements which eventually end up inside us. So those were the three forces known in 1955. There were, however, weird things happening in experiments. And as a theorist, I have to confess to you, it is actually experiment which tells us how things work. I know we theorists like to tell you that we've got it all sorted out and there'll be a lot of people here claiming string theory explains it all. I'm just saying this so that Ben, who introduced me, wakes up at this point. Experiment will tell us whether that's right or wrong. An experiment has a habit of showing things that we hadn't anticipated. And in the 1940s, um, the way the experiment was going was looking at cosmic rays, sending balloons high up in the atmosphere because out there in space, nature is providing us with naturally produced high-energy particles. Exploding stars, phenomena that we don't totally understand even now, throw out particles into space, and the magnetic fields in space move them around, and some of them hit the upper atmosphere, and in doing so, smash the atomic nuclei in the atoms of the atmosphere into pieces, and showers of particles come falling down, and in fact are passing through us right now. So by sending up detectors in balloons to the high atmosphere, you could detect these primary cosmic rays. And in doing so, they found not just the ordinary particles that were known, like electrons and protons and photons, but particles with very strange properties, which became known as strange particles. And nobody had anticipated these. What they were, nobody knew. And it was in part the desire to understand what nature was revealing from out there. There's more going on that we had previously known down here. That was what the birth of particle physics, in a way, was in the 1950s. The desire to be able to replicate the cosmic rays in earthly experiments. 
So the top picture shows a picture coming in from the left, probably an atom of an iron nucleus that's come in in a cosmic ray, detected in some emulsions, hitting an, atom, uh, an atom and shattering it into pieces, which goes sharing along. At the bottom, you have a picture from many years later, an experiment where a beam of atomic nuclei has smashed into a target and produced secondary particles. The point being that the observation of cosmic rays, the observation discovery of unusual particles in them, led to the desire to replicate cosmic ray collisions in the laboratory under control conditions to see if we could understand what was going on. And that was the beginnings of modern high-energy physics. The result, 50 years later, is that the basic structure of matter, as far as the electron is concerned, we know of nothing deeper than it. As far as the proton and neutron in the center of the nucleus, we certainly do know something deeper than it. We know that protons and neutrons are actually little clouds of quarks. And that these many different varieties of particle that were discovered in cosmic rays, and when they started doing the accelerator experiments, they found hundreds of varieties of such things, are all different combinations of the quarks linked together. Just like different combinations of uh, electrons make different types of elements with excited levels, so different combinations of quarks make different collective particles with excited levels. And so these hundreds of varieties of particles that have been discovered in cosmic rays and in particle physics during the 1950s and 60s, we now know are all due to a deeper layer of reality, namely the quarks. And today, to the best experiments that we can do, electrons and quarks appear to be the basic letters of nature's alphabet. Now, I stress when I say to the best experiments we can do. We have seen this morning how energy scales of TeV which is the highest that we can produce in the laboratory, correspond to distance scales of 10 to the minus 18 meters. So what we're really saying is that on a distance scale of 10 to the minus 18 meters, electrons and quarks appear to have no structure. But if we were to do experiments at 100 TeV and probe distances 1,000 times smaller, we might discover that, in fact, the electrons and quarks have an internal structure. Just a repeat of what we have seen over the last century, when atoms were thought to be elementary and then you discovered a structure. The atomic nucleus was thought to be elementary and you discovered a structure. Why not the same thing again? That's a fair question. We'll discuss it as we go along and you'll hear reasons why we think it isn't that simple, or maybe it is. We don't yet know. But experimentally, all we know today is that at this distance scale, electrons and quarks appear to be the basic seeds. There are many profound similarities between electrons and quarks that we will meet that suggest that if they are not fundamental, there is something very special this time round that nature is conspiring as if they are. And this is one of the conundrums of science, to try to build a theory that unifies electrons and quarks into some simple, single theory. Electrons and quarks are very similar. They've got similar masses, similar size. They spin at the same rate. And they also respond to the forces, reading the same rules. And that's really what these lectures are going to show you. The reason we believe that something we've found like this is going on, that there is a unity to it all, is because what we have discovered about the way the forces work has evolved in a very profound way. Fifty years ago, I said electromagnetic and weak and strong. Today we know that the electromagnetic and weak are two different faces of the same coin. There's a single force called the electroweak force. The electro part is what we call electromagnetic. The weak part is what we call the weak. The electroweak force binds electrons in atoms and also generates radioactivity. And the way that these have become unified will be the theme of the third lecture. We have also discovered that the strong force that holds the atomic nuclei together is actually a long range. When I say long range, I mean at the size of atomic nuclei as compared to the sizes of the quarks in the middle. The strong force is a long range effect of a much more profound force working at the level of the quarks called the color force or QCD, quantum chromodynamics. You'll hear these words as we go along. So these are what we're going to meet. There's a quantum chromodynamic force acting on the quarks, as we will see, it obeys the same sort of rules as the electromagnetic and weak forces that work 
on the outsides. So the hints are that the forces which we thought were completely different 50 years ago are beginning, apart from gravity, are beginning to look as if they're sort of the same. They look different in the cold, but they look the same at high energies. And that is completing the pattern of where we wanted to go. This phenomenon that in the cold you see structure and dissimilarity. In the warm and the hot, you see unity and uniformity. The forces appear to be like snowflakes in the cold. Electromagnetic, weak and strong, very different. In the hot, in experiments that we've done in particle physics over the last 50 years, we see that they actually are very similar. So that is what we know. The cold and the warm we know, and the theorists then Quickly, we want to extrapolate, if we could get to the very hot, the electroweak, which we already experimentally know has sort of melted away into one, will also melt away with the strong to make a grand unified force. That is theory, and experiment will eventually tell us if that is right or not. And now we extrapolate to the final thing of all, is that, as we will see, where we're going to in these lectures and the ones that will follow throughout these weeks that our modern picture of electrons and quarks and other basic particles that we will meet is known as the standard model of quarks. Leptons is a generic name for electrons and some other particles like it, and the forces that bind them together. And this standard model is itself a pattern, and we will see in the fourth lecture what I mean by that. It's a pattern that is based upon mass. And what we mean by cold and hot now has at last a quantitative meaning. Because mass, mc squared, is energy. So if we are at energies below about a TeV, that is what I mean by cold. It is the, relatively speaking, low energy world that we have been limited to until now, where the pattern of the standard model reveals itself, like the snowflake. The theory suggests that something very special happens at about the TeV energy or temperature scale. And that as you go above that in experiments, you will see, in effect, a melting away of this pattern. And you will see a deeper symmetry underlying it all. And you will hear words like supersymmetry. And the manifestations of this, among the experimental manifestations, will be things like the Higgs boson, and I grandiosely say, the nature of reality. Um, why not? Um, but the real thing is, the exciting thing is for theorists, and for experimenters too, I think, that we have got a lot of theoretical reasons why we think this is pretty well right, but nature has a habit of showing there are subtle things that you never anticipate. And then the experiment in two or three years will reveal them, and we'll be kicking ourselves and saying, why didn't we think of that? So that is where we've got to for the moment, and I will then, the next two lectures, develop one lecture about the particles, one lecture about the forces, and one lecture about unifying it all together. Okay. I think we come back in about a quarter of an hour. <laughs>